Hello, good evening, and welcome to Messages of Hope. I'm your host, Jill Lublin. I'm the author of three best-selling books, including Guerrilla Publicity, Networking Magic, and Get Noticed, Get Referrals. Tonight, we have another inspiring show for you, and I'm featuring David Roach, who's an inspirational humorist and author of The Church of 80% Sincerity. Welcome, David. <laughs> thanks, Jill. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, you're welcome. See, even the title makes us laugh, right? <laughs> it's a great title. I mean, people will buy it no matter what's inside, you know, just well, on the title. And I'm wondering, why 80% sincerity? Why? Do you think that that's a little high for you, Jill? Or? It's a big bar to reach, 80% yeah. sincerity. Yeah, we probably set it pretty low. <laughs> well, we'll have a special holiday offer. If you can bring somebody else to buy the book, then we'll have two people totaling 80% sincerity. It's a lot easier that <laughs> that's way. That's right. But do you think that most people aren't sincere 100% of the time? Is, th is that the issue? Well, I'd say that it's pretty hard to be 100% sincere all the time. Uh, you can try, but uh, it's just too difficult. So we set the bar a little more reasonably, I think. Yeah, for real people. It's a for book real for people. real people. It's for <laughs> real people, yeah. But, you know, I know all your life you've really been dealing with some real issues. So mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about that because, you know, it's pretty obvious that you have had your, shall we call them challenges in your yeah. life? And I love it that you speak about what you're dealing with is wearing your dark side on the outside. And would you explain to us what the condition on your face is so that people understand? Sure. Uh, I was born with a birth difference, not a birth defect, please. A birth difference, back then it was called an extensive cavernous hemangioma now it's more accurately called a vascular or venous malformation. My blood vessels, my veins are swollen, engorged uh, down the side of my neck, down to my collarbone, in, in my tongue. Uh, when I was uh, just born, it was just a slight discoloration on my left eyelid. So when they I didn't see it when you were just born? My mother noticed it and asked the doctor. The doctor said, um, don't worry, Mrs. Rhodes, it will go away in a few days. Well, mm. it's been, what, about uh, uh, 20,000 days <laughs> so far, and it hasn't gone away. Uh, at, when I was one year old, the lower part of my face blossomed into what looked like a bunch of grapes, so I had surgeries at the Mayo Clinic. I had radiation therapy. It was very popular in those days, kind of a miracle cure, but that caused the lower part of my face to stop growing, and I lost most all my teeth. And I've had various other procedures as time has gone by. But basically, I was born with this face. So, a face a mother can love, right? Yeah, <laughs> she knows, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, obviously, that would bring up a lot, right? I mean, so they did radiation therapy and actually made you worse, is what happened. You know, uh, there's times when I felt like a victim uh, being experimented on, but really uh, that just doesn't help anything. And uh, I've come to believe that the hands that touch me uh, or the instruments that touch me were held in loving hands. And that's generally been my experience throughout my adult life, too. Well, but I would assume, David, it took you, shall we say, some time to get there. I mean, what was oh, this yeah. like growing up? with a face that probably scared people. What was that it like? It often did. Um, first of all, my parents never talked about my face. I'm from the generation of denial, which was a blessing in a lot of ways. It was like, get out there, do what you have to do. If somebody asks, tell them it's a birthmark. You know, mm. no discussion, certainly no talking about some of the feelings of difference, of being ostracized, of comments, sidelong glances, averted glances, stares, and so on. I know um, you have some story about when, uh, when you were younger, something happened with a, a young kid and they ran from you. What was that story you used to tell? Um, well, there's been, mostly people are kind and courteous and respectful, but there are occasional uh, cruelties. Uh, uh, one of the scary things that happened, I think, that you're referring to is uh, I was kind of ambushed by a group of uh, little boys at one point uh, that 
they thought that they were attacking a monster mm. um, and uh, came at me with karate kicks and so on. Mm. And uh, uh, it was uh, just out of the blue, and so it was a terrible shock to me. You know, when you're caught unawares with something like that, um, that's the hard time. Well, I'm sure. Did you feel, I mean, you're, you're in a way saying you didn't really notice. Like other people noticed, but you didn't. No, I always did notice. Well, you know, kids up to about middle school, it's not that big of a thing. It's mm -hmm. that when the trickle of hormones comes, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it's, oh, you know, uh, I, I'm weird and I don't fit in. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when it gets difficult. So as that period was coming in your adolescence and you were learning how to be with yourself and be mm -hmm. with others, what happened for you? How did you deal with it? I dealt with it. I had actually a lot of tools. Um, parents of kids with facial differences often uh, are very concerned about what's going to happen uh, with their children. And I, I have the occasion to tell them often that the things that work for you, for the quote, normal people, mm -hmm. are the same things that work for people who look different. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom used to tell me, Dave, honey, you are so smart. Mm. You're so smart. You could be anything you want to be, honey. Oh. You can. And she told me that so often that I believed her. So yeah. I always had confidence in my intelligence. Good. So that helps. Um, I always had confidence in my sense of humor, and that helps a lot. And I always had confidence in my charm, you know. So, and I got kind of training in a, a large Irish Catholic family, you know, where humor and charm are very valuable qualities. So um, th those kind of things help me so that I could use my tongue to fight back, to defend myself. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Well, and that would be an important time for you. And I know now, you know, that you take that work and you, you teach younger children, right, to appreciate diversity and differences. I often speak in schools. My wife, Marlena, and I have a program that we do in middle schools called Love at Second Sight, mm -hmm. where I talk about what it was like for me at that <laughs> age, like showing up at my first boy-girl party, not knowing what was going on. It was a Halloween party. I was dressed in a clown outfit. What was the first game we played? Spin the bottle, of course. Who's the first spinner? Cutest girl at Our Lady of Grace School, Patty. Do you remember her from seventh grade? I you remember probably? one of them. <laughs> yeah, it was Patty. You know, uh, she was one of the kids who had enough money to have all, a number of those fuzzy sweaters, you know. And <laughs> Do they so, have caps on them? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, I don't remember that. But uh, if they were in fashion, she had them. And so she was the first spinner, and of course the bottle pointed to me. And um, she said, oh, no, not you, mm. and um, reached down the spin again. And so that's the kind of thing that um, started happening. What in happened for you in that moment? What happened for me in that moment was I just clammed up. I had no way of talking about it. When I tell the kids, you know, when I tell the kids, I say, well, I look back at Patty and I said, Patty, I know you want me. And they laugh, and I say, well, no, that was a lie, sorry. Um, uh, it, it, it was denial. Denial worked for me to a great degree, except the price that you pay for something like that is you don't talk about the feelings about it. No, of course not. And you also went through a lot of physical uh, dealing with this issue, right? You had multiple operations yeah. and mm -hmm. constant procedures, we'll call them, right? Procedures, yeah. Bright, cold, metal, sharp things. That's what procedures are. That's right. Pain. No, not pain. Discomfort. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> a, a little discomfort. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. you've been dealing with that multiple times throughout your whole life, right? Yeah. I, uh, the truth is, I don't think I've had a huge amount of pain. I, I really think it has been discomfort. So, hmm. yeah, I can't really complain. I, I just know lots of people with a lot more severe problems than I have. Um, but I don't, I don't need to downplay what's happened for me. It's very real. But Well, it is very real, but what I'm struck by in a certain way is that 
you're um, not only great in dealing with it, but that you, it's like it's not a big deal to you. But let's face it, I think when somebody sees you for a first time or forms an impression, you know, everybody's judging in a certain way, right? Physical appearance, how one looks. And you walk into a room and immediately what happens? People see an exterior. Yeah. And I happen to know also the interior of who you are, which is very deep and very profound and funny and charming and all those things you say, which I think did get you through. That's what I love is how you, you did it no matter what. And it just didn't matter what anyone thought. Yeah, of course, I had my bad days, okay? Um, for sure, and I write about that too. I'm pretty honest about it. It's not only things that, oh yeah, if you feel good about yourself, then everything's fine. No, it doesn't work that way. Well, tell us about that, the bad days. So how did you get through that? Well, I drank, okay? Uh -huh. um, I self-medicated. That was uh, a one way that I got by. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't like start at a certain point. It was sort of like the culture that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was something that helped. That certainly helped with the denial. And I, I chose other ways of I, I also, I discriminated against myself. Yeah. I learned not to go places or to be with people that were not safe. Uh -huh. You know, I you know I went to Catholic school. Uh -huh. It was a safe place. They discouraged teasing. Well, it took place, but it wasn't around my appearance. Mm -hmm. You know, my family, same kind of thing, my mm -hmm. friends. Uh, so, uh, I, and then I went to uh, study to be a Catholic priest for four years. So that hid me away for a while. So, and I learned, like I say, uh, to discriminate against myself, to not go places that were not safe for me. Well, I think really you were protective of yourself. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that was a, a good defense and mm -hmm. a good offense. It served me well, yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, so you decided you wanted to be a priest. Tell yeah. me about that. Well, I was, this, I was a good little boy. You know, that was kind of my way of getting by. Um, and I was the oldest of seven in an Irish Catholic family in the Midwest in the 1950s. Mm. And so, of course, uh, I was taught in school that you should think if you want to be a priest, if you might hear God's calling, then you should really try it. And uh, actually, that my first attempt to do that was uh, a difficult experience because I wanted to go to the seminary that was at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana. It's where they play football, so that's sort of religious. Um, and uh, I interviewed there and I told them how much I love Jesus and how my Aunt Rose had leaned over my cradle and said, this boy is destined to be a bishop. And um, the priest told me that I was too ugly to be a priest. Wow. Um, they said that uh, the prisoners would not be able to respect me. Um, and so that, that was probably the single most difficult thing that happened to me um, in my life. Because it came, like I say, out of the blue. And the way I was raised, that was like the voice of God telling me that I was a monster. And it came out of the culture, out of the religious environment that I was raised in, where the, to use the, the phrase of my childhood, that I was a child of God, a valuable individual. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, that whole way of uh, seeing myself uh, crumbled. Wow. And so I had to rebuild. That's sort of like the point, I think, that I had to rebuild from. How old were you then? I was 13. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so they gave you this feedback, we'll call it. Yeah. And, and then what happened? How did you rebuild yourself? That's a pretty serious statement to make to somebody. Yeah, I, I shrank inside myself. I did go to a different seminary. Um, I, 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 care, I think the way I would describe it is I, I, my soul kind of shriveled up, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't have my sense of self. It took me a long time to grow emotionally and spiritually. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I tried different things. I tried being a hippie. I was the world's only anal retentive hippie. <laughs> it really, really didn't work, you know. What is an anal retentive hippie? <laughs> it's like you do the dishes before you light up, okay? <laughs> or you try and get the other people to do the dishes, you know. No, it doesn't work. That's funny. Yeah. 